go out in public and see today's young men and I'm just like something's not clicking for me something's just not doing it for me I don't know what it is like I really don't and then I'll see those TikToks of the men like the actors from the 60s the 50s and the 60s and they were so handsome I don't know maybe it's just the way they dressed but like I don't like old men I love young men I just love young men back then you know adolescence is hard for anybody it is hard for anybody, but when you have a society that has conspired against you, it's even harder. And that is what's happening with all the gender confusion that's taking place. I just had an interesting little personal experience that is that, that caused some deep reflection on my part. And I was doing a little Christmas shopping. I go into a store. I'm needing help because I'm looking at an item and I need to know a little bit about it. It's price. There's nothing on it and, you know, how it works, this sort of thing. And so I ask for help. And so they call for help. I stand and wait and someone comes to me. And as I'm, I'm about to ask my question, being Southern, I almost prefaced it with, uh, ma'am, ma'am, how much is this? And something restrained me because, the, first of all, the appearance of this person restrained me because this person was very opaque. I don't mean just, just regular sunglasses. These were opaque sunglasses and a black mask, which completely obscured the face. And uh, I wasn't sure if I was actually talking to a ma'am. I didn't know if I was talking to a male or female. So I didn't say ma'am. I just said, how much, how much is this? And, uh, and, and again, you know, you have the sunglasses, you have the mask, you have baggy gothic clothing that is clearly meant to hide any clues as to whether or not I thought either this is kind of a this is kind of an effeminate male, or it is a somewhat masculine female. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't figure it out from what this person was wearing. And then add to that that the hair was exceptionally short. And it was then that I saw the name tag. It's, it had the name Zen. I've changed the name. They, and just below it, they slash them. And I don't normally play along with this sort of nonsense, but something checked me. And I'm going to guess that it was the Holy Spirit that I decided in that moment, something, you know, just kind of swept across me, this feeling that I was dealing with a very wounded person. And so I just said, uh, which I guess is a little risky. I don't know. I, you know, given the sensitivities here, I could have hurt this person's feelings. But I said, uh, you know, I can't see who I'm talking to. And I didn't say it in a challenging way. I didn't say it in an aggressive way. I was just kind of like, hey, we're interacting. Let me know who, who it is that I'm talking to. And so somewhat sheepishly, this person took off the sunglasses and pulled out of a pocket regular prescription glasses. And I said, such a lovely face. And the eyes were decidedly female. And so was the voice, you know, in answering my question, it's 59, it's 59.95. And um, she, as it was a she, was eager to help, was very professional, uh, seemed, seemed to want to please me and uh, in helping me, was very energetic in doing what I asked and um, answering my questions. And when our business was concluded, she turned and she pulled off again the prescription glasses and pulled out of her pocket the opaque sunglasses and they went back on. Now, there's something I want to say uh, as it relates to this. There are some of you that when I told this story in a in a Twitter thread, there's some people who respond to this, hopefully not members of the posse, um, who respond to this like, I won't talk to, I won't talk to a non-human like that, or these people are subhuman, you know, or something like that. That's that's not 
at all the message that I'm, I want to convey, and it certainly is the message that I was conveying in that particular Twitter thread. It's important that you understand when we're talking about the LGBTQ alphabet soup people, my experience tells me that there are two groups there. There's, there's the one group that I refer to as the alphabet mafia. And those people are the militants. They're the ones who are pushing this agenda. They're aggressive. They're the ones, if, if, if this had been a member of the Alphabet Mafia, this person would have wanted to, to argue and fight with me because that's, that's the way they behave. But there's a second group that are within that Alphabet suit, but they're not part of the Alphabet Mafia. They are the people who are deeply confused, they are utterly lost, and they're looking for community. And my experience as a, um, as a teacher of youth for so long, engaging them both on, at the, the, the preparatory school, the high school, and, uh, and collegiate level and beyond, has taught me this, that very frequently, not always, I want to be clear about that, but very frequently, they are people who have been failed by the adults in their lives, primarily by their, pre uh, by their parents. And again, if you are the parent of such a child, I'm not saying that it's your fault. That's between you and God. Um, that sin nature is real so i don't i don't want to sound freudian in suggesting that every wayward child is a result of bad parenting god our lord who is a perfect father has the most wayward children <laughs> so we know that sin nature is real we don't we don't we don't need to have outside influences to do wicked things and to do silly things you know like this and certainly this kind of transgenderism is among other things it's uh, it's silly and it's an attack on the image of God. It's an attack on the way that God has made you. But they are often people who are deeply wounded. And my experience suggests that they're frequently those kids who didn't quite fit in. Maybe they weren't the athlete. Maybe they were um, people who... Uh, you know, had to wear, you know, bottle cap glasses or for whatever reason, they didn't quite fit in. And um, they were called names. Uh, maybe they were bullied. Uh, people of sensitive nature and they're longing for community. They're longing for friends and they end up finding it in one of these kind of groups that that is of an alternative uh, sexual lifestyle whether it's lesbianism or you know just standard homosexuality or whether we're talking about you know transgenderism or or something along those lines they end up finding community there and so when people will say to me well these are these are people who do not conform no they absolutely conform they conform to a subgroup when if if you were to meet their group you would see that they're conforming to that group both in dress and manner and language and often also in behavior and unfortunately like this in sexual behavior. But what I want to say to you is try to be astute enough to be able to draw the distinction between the groups. The aggressive group, those that the alphabet mafia, those are the people, <laughs> those are the people that that you want to be prepared to turn over their tables, so to speak, um, as, as Jesus you know, might have done. But then there's another group that you should show compassion to uh, because they're lost. They're utterly lost. And rather than rebelling um, the way the alphabet mafia might, they, they tend to be people who are seeking and they just haven't found it. And those are the people we want to show compassion to. Those are the kind of people that, that we hope we are engaging with them and we're engaging with them tenderly. We're engaging with them thoughtfully. And it has been my privilege to do that over the years many times. But listen, parents, I cannot tell you the number of times I have been asked by parents to do their job. Could, could you talk to my daughter? She dresses inappropriately. Once upon a time, I was a dean of students in a preparatory school, and often parents would ask you to say things like that. You know, their, their daughter is dressing like a prostitute and coming to school, but the parents won't parent. And so they ask you to do that, that job. And I would say, <laughs> no, 
No, that is not a conversation I want to have. If the child is dressed inappropriately, I will send that child home. Um, but you need to be the person who does that. I've also had many parents want, want to um, me to address some other problem that they were having with, with a child or to speak to their college age kids. Now, by this, I don't mean, you know, instances where they're seeking your assistance. I'm talking about where they're basically punting their responsibility in handing it over to you. Parents, parents, please parent. What's going on in the life of a child like this? And I say child, she's, you know, probably, uh, probably 20. What's going on in the life of, of, of an adult like this, a young woman like this, who's trying to, she's wearing basically uh, urban camouflage and she's trying to hide trying to obscure her face. She's trying to obscure her sex. She's trying to hide from the world. She's trying to hide her sex from the world. What is going on in the mind and the life of someone like that? Parents, please parents. And that means also to discipline. Don't just simply, don't, don't just simply discipline. You have to raise up your child. You have to shepherd their hearts, but be willing to to discipline and to shape and mold their hearts and to shape and mold their character. And that brings me to something else that I saw on Twitter. And it is this. I want you to watch this. This is a young woman who has a, I, I don't know if she's an influencer. I know nothing about her. This was tweeted by an account called The Best. And uh, this, this account just tweets out all kinds of just fascinating cultural things. And that's usually kind of an upbeat account, um, in this case, not, not attacking uh, this, uh, this young woman. And in fact, refers to the woman as Rapunzel. Now, watch this, watch this video here. Now, she's letting down her hair. And wow, does it cascade down her back? You know, so if you're if if you're listening and you're not you're not able to watch, uh, her hair was up, and then she you know I don't know if it's a rubber band or whatever she had, but she takes it off, and the hair goes all the way down to the ground, and it is just a beautiful head of hair. It's an incredible head of hair. My guess is that this is an influencer and she's making some kind of money, you know, on shampoos and conditioners or something. I don't know. Now, I'm showing you this because I thought the comments on this were very interesting. Some of them were kind of mean. Like somehow there was something, you know, perverse, you know, in what she was doing. And I get it. Some people were just uh, just speaking in terms of practicality. How long does it take to wash that? How long does it take to dry that? I mean, how do you live your life with hair that's as long as that? Those, those kind of practical concerns uh, I get. But kind of attacking her like she's doing something, you know, immoral here struck me as odd. And my guess is that there's, there's uh, no small measure of jealousy that is involved in that for some women who might attack um, this woman. And again, I know nothing about her. I don't know who she is. I don't know her lifestyle. I'm not making any declarations there. Rather, I say it to make a point that relates to what we're talking about when we are talking about transgenderism. Because when I saw this, I thought of two things. First of all, I thought of Rita Hayworth. <laughs> Rita Hayworth. You ever seen Shawshank Redemption? There's a very famous scene in that movie where uh, Tim Robbins and um, what's his name? I've forgotten his name. Morgan Freeman. They're watching a movie in the prison and one comes to the other. I can't remember which is which. And he's talking to him and he says, wait, 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 wait. And he's watching a scene and it's Rita Hayworth in some movie. I don't know which one. And it's a very famous scene where she undoes her hair and then she flips her hair. And all these guys who are watching go, ah, you know, as they're watching, as they're watching this scene. And then he says, okay, now go on. He, he had obviously seen the, the film many times before, and he was waiting for that particular scene. That was the first thing I thought of. The second thing I thought of was my daughter, Sasha. And that is because Sasha, when we adopted her, she was almost 11. We adopted her in 2009 from a Ukrainian orphanage. And uh, Sasha had maybe one set of clothes. Uh, they, were, they were not girly uh, at all. 
Uh, children were abused in the orphanages. They did not get proper medical attention. Uh, she had some, uh, you know, seven rotten teeth that once we adopted her that, that had to be pulled almost immediately because she had exposed uh, nerve endings. Uh, and uh, somewhat traumatically uh, for the girls, when the children in the orphanage would get lice, which was uh, often they would shave their heads. They would shave their heads. It was just cheaper than giving them medication. They just shave their heads. Now, most little boys don't like that, but that is traumatic for a girl. It is traumatic for a girl. So when we adopted Sasha, bear in mind, I came from a family of boys, and until we adopted Sasha, we had all boys. We had all boys. So the only, the only women in, uh, in our testosterone-driven world were the mothers, the grandmothers. That was it. So uh, it's me and, uh, and my three boys and Lori. And then comes Sasha, who, who was a bit of a tomboy. She had short hair at the time. Of, she was just, it was just starting to get to a feminine length again after it having been shaved. And um, she's, she is uh, still very much <clears throat> a little girl. And as I say, she was, she was very tomboyish, somewhat, somewhat masculine in the way she moved and talked and, and her interests and this kind of stuff. But the moment she was given the chance to be a girl, she embraced it <laughs> big time and almost without any, you know, any encouragement to do so. By that, I don't mean we were discouraging. I just mean, you know, there wasn't any push for her to be to be anything other than, than what she was. And the boys and I are walking along. I tell this story in The Grace Effect, <clears throat> my book, which would make, by the way, a great gift for someone. We're walking along in Odessa, Ukraine, um, through a mall, and uh, the boys and I suddenly realize Sasha isn't with us. And we look back, and she has stopped in front of a store window where she has seen a Barbie doll. Now, this is before Barbie had gone to all the weird stuff. She'd never seen a Barbie doll in her whole life. And she sees this one, and she's absolutely captivated by it. And I remember thinking to myself, isn't this interesting? She's not been subject to any marketing and she is already attracted to these little dolls, these little girly dolls. Getting her to the United States, she gets proper medical attention. She gets a proper diet. Meat, protein really wasn't part of her diet. She starts putting on weight. I think she gained 20 pounds in the first three months, just almost instantaneously. <clears throat> and you begin to see that she starts to become a woman, a beautiful woman. And Sasha wants all things pink. She wants dresses. She wants all the stuff for her hair, perfume, makeup, you name it. She wants it. But where she indulged her femininity most of all was with her hair. Sasha wanted to never cut it. And that's because in the orphanage, again, it was kept short because they're shaving it all the time for lice. So now, given the opportunity to take warm showers, which she didn't have in the past, she would get in the shower. I would, I would have to knock on the door and say, Sasha, <laughs> please, there are other people waiting to use the shower. <laughs> but I knew that she was just luxuriating in the warmth of the shower. And I'd say, okay, it's fine. 30 minutes, however, is enough. You need to let somebody else in there. And her hair, she didn't want to cut it. So Lori and I Lori and I had to convince her to cut it. Now, where am I going with this? Femininity and masculinity are innate. They're biological factors. You see, the left wants you to believe that masculinity and femininity, that the difference between males and females is only physical and then only slight. There are only minor differences between men and women, never mind the fact that the average male is twice as strong as the average female, never mind the fact that the average male has roughly a third more lung capacity than the average female. Hence the reason these so-called transgender men are annihilating women when they enter into their sports. 
because they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. But the left, their narrative is, ah, they're only just some modest differences. But part of that narrative is also that the person who fills the body is gender neutral. I'll say their spirit. Now, the left doesn't believe in spirit because they don't believe in God. But, but the person, the spirit that fills the physical thing, the physical body, that they're gender neutral. And they only become male or female as a result of cultural influences. It's this sort of warped thinking that leads to such foolish parents as Charlize Theron and Angelina Jolie and even Marlon Wayans saying they were leaving it up to their children to determine their own sex. We'll post a headline or two demonstrating that. That's just, you know, smart parents, smart parents do not let their children choose their bedtime, if they brush their teeth, what they do or don't eat, how they educate themselves. They don't leave these decisions to them. And yet here you have parents saying, ah, we're leaving this decision to them. I mean, this is, this is depraved thinking. And it's also this kind of depraved thinking that has given us phrases like a man trapped in a woman's body or similar. You've heard that. And that's what they mean by that, is they mean that the spirit, that the person that fills the body they're, they may or may not match up with their physical form. That's absolutely insane, the thinking here. Now, this has been used as a justification for the genital, genital mutilation of countless children. So what they're saying is, is that in the nature versus nurture debate, the left has decided in favor of nurture. They're saying it's, it's nurture, that, that they can, they reason, alter everything from sex to belief in God because the person is tabula rasa, a blank slate. Richard Dawkins, who would not believe any of what I just said about uh, on the gender issue, but the famed atheist has argued that he, without any offering any scientific evidence, which is funny to me because he claims that you know everything is about science. He claimed in his book, uh, his best-selling book, um, 2006, I think is when it came out, The God Delusion, that children are innately atheistic. They don't believe in God. Now, his Oxford University colleague, Dr. Olivera Petrovich, who is a research psychologist, I've talked to her a number of times. I, I share her research in my book, um, The Grace Effect, again, which would make a great gift, um, that this is complete nonsense. Children are not born um, neutral on the question of God's existence or non-existence. They're born theists. The science tells us this. They are born theists. Now, they're not born adherents to any specific religion. That has to be taught. Uh, so they're not born Muslims or born Christians. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, they're not born Muslims. They're born with an innate belief in the transcendent. And they have to be taught the tenets of a specific religion religion. But, um, but anyway, uh, what's true there that we're not born neutral on the question, we're not born atheists, is also true when it comes to um, uh, male or female. Uh, it's not just simply our bodies that are male or female, um, but the person who fills it is male or female, as has been determined by God himself in the body that he has given them. So it's important that you understand that the ideas that are going, by, going on uh, behind all of this. And this brings me to, it's kind of where I'd sort of like to land this episode of the show today. And it is with advice for young men. And I guess also for young women, I, I don't, I don't want to just simply complain as so many do about Gen Zers and, uh, and millennials. I don't want to do that. I, I think it's unfair to you. Uh, and that is because it is the responsibility. If you take Titus two seriously, Titus two says the older should teach the younger. And, and if you take seriously what I said earlier in this episode about the young woman with the they, them tag, such people have been failed by the adults in their lives, 
by teachers, by spiritual leaders, by parents, by somebody who has told them that this is a good and acceptable kind of behavior when it isn't. They've affirmed them in that. They've given them positive reinforcement when it should have been negative reinforcement. But there are other areas of their life where, where, where they probably got negative reinforcement when they needed positive reinforcement. They needed encouragement. Adolescence is hard for anybody. It is hard for anybody. But when you have a society that has conspired against you, it's even harder. And that is what's happening with our children today. Society, our government, often our churches and schools have conspired against them. So I want to offer a little bit of advice. I want to offer a little encouragement. And that brings me to a little video that I saw circulating on social media, and it was getting a lot of response. Um, she's some kind of TikTok influencer. Some of you may know who she is. And, uh, but I want you to listen to what she says here. I have no idea how old she is, 25, 20. I, I don't know. But this was getting a lot of attention. And it's not particularly profound, but let's listen to what she, she says here. I am sick. I, I'm sick because I will go out in public and see today's young men. And I'm just like, something's not clicking for me. Something's just not doing it for me. I've been single for four years. Um, but then I'll go to the thrift store. And you know those like little buckets that have like the old photos in them? Yeah, I'll look through those. And I'm like, whose grandpa is this? Because he was so fine. Okay. Like my grandpa who was in World War II, not him. Okay, Re let, give me a second. My grandpa who was in World War II, a fighter pilot, he was alive until a few years ago and he was wonderful. And when he passed away, I was the one who was like, give me all these family photos, like give me everything, like give me the photos. So I have photos of him and his squadron, I think you call it. They were the real, t like they were so fun. Not my grandpa, but the men that he was flying and working with. They were so handsome. And... I don't know what it is like I really don't and then I'll see those TikToks of the men like the actors from the 60s the 50s and the 60s and they were so handsome I don't know maybe it's just the way they dressed but like I don't like old men I love young men I just love young men back then you know okay let's um uh, let me distill what she's saying here she's saying that you know, she starts looking at old photos of her grandfather and her grandfather, who was he? He apparently was a pilot in World War II. And here she is looking at old photos of him and his squadron and some of the men from his era. And she finds it quite jarring because she's thinking to herself, wow, these men are, they're masculine. They're, they're handsome. They're, there's something about them that I find very appealing. I think that what is going on here, first of all, with all the gender confusion that's taking place, the advice I would want to offer to any young man um, who's finding the whole dating scene depressing, discouraging, difficult, and this advice, by the way, applies not just to something like dating or, or uh, relationships with the opposite sex, but it's professional advice as well, and that is this. What she's responding to is the appearance. She doesn't know any of these people. I mean, she knew her grandfather, but the other, she's just simply responding to a photograph. So what is she responding to in that? Well, that they are masculine, that they appear to be masculine, that they are dressed. Uh, undoubtedly, they were probably wearing their uniforms or, or, uh, or something similar uh, from that era, which would have been fairly conservative. Uh, it would have been, um, it would have, it would have looked nice. It would have looked professional, and it would say something about their self-respect and their respect for other people. The way you dress matters, and one of the things that the pandemic has done that I think is, um, is very detrimental to, to all of us, but to your generation in particular, is the other day I was, you know, Lori said she needed to run into a grocery store, and so this was a, a Publix, I think, and so I did what I almost always do, which is I pull up straight to the door, I let her get out, and then I, um, I go and I sit and I sort of watch the door. She signals me when she's done. And then I, uh, you know, 
pull up to the door, pick her up, and we're gone. So I'm sitting there, and this time I'm watching the people who are going in and out of this store, and it really struck me how people were dressed. Now, there's there's this longstanding trope about people going to Walmart, you know, and they're sweating. It isn't just Walmart. It's anywhere these days. People frequently don't profession, dress professionally. And that says, that says a lot about you because it says something about your, your respect for yourself. Do you take care of yourself? But also, do you respect other people? When I go to meetings, depending on the kind of meeting that it is, I try to dress in a manner that shows respect for them, that I take them seriously, that I have dressed appropriate to the occasion. Now, please understand, I'm not saying to you that there isn't an occasion that it's appropriate, you know, to um, to wear a t-shirt and, and you know blue jeans. I certainly do that um, plenty. Uh, but even at home, I appreciate the the fact that my wife gets up and she dresses nice, even when she's not going out. She puts on makeup, whether she's not going. She does her hair. She does those things. She does those things for me, and I'm grateful for that. I try not to wear just a, a, a wife beater and lay around the house and look like a slob. I try to look nice. And it's important because it says something about your self-respect, but also the respect that you have for other people. How does that relate to things professionally? I think it's incredibly important. I, as somebody who conducts, I don't know, probably... Three or three to five times a year, I'm interviewing someone for a position uh, with my organization. And the very first impression you get is are they on time? Do they look you in the eye? Do they give you a solid handshake? Are they, they, they confident and well spoken? And how are they dressed? I deal with a lot of top CEOs, just a lot of guys who are involved in my work who are CEOs of of everything from small um, family businesses to Fortune 500 companies. And without prompt from me, I consistently hear complaints about the people they're interviewing for jobs who do not come and ask the right kinds of questions, who are asking questions almost entirely about what they get versus what they do, what are their duties. I remember when I was first going for a job, uh, you know, I'd mowed lawns and did all kinds of things like that. Um, uh, but now I was old enough to get an actual job. I was 15. And someone had called uh, because I, I would sweep his storefront. A little job that I had from the time I was probably 10 years old as I would walk to the, um, <laughs> I was semi-entrepreneurial. I would walk to the local shopping center. I would get where my mom had a store and I would get a broom um, from her back closet and I would go store to store in this strip mall. And I would say, hey, you know, for 50 cents, I'll sweep your storefront. And, you know, they'd invariably say, sure. Well, when I turned 15, somebody who had a grocery store there called my mom and said, hey, would your son like a job? And as I was going for the interview, my mother said to me, which was grand advice, she said, your job is to make your boss look good. Your job is to make your boss look good. That's your job. That's your responsibility. Now, if you take the job, doesn't mean you don't ask questions about what the benefits are, what you get. But if you're, not, if you're not showing enthusiasm for the work itself, then it suggests you probably shouldn't be applying for the job. And if you're not dressing appropriate to the job, you shouldn't be applying for the job. Self-respect is exhibited outwardly in the way you care for yourself. Do you shave? Do you, do you, um, do you exercise at all? Do you... Do you care for your person? But it also matters. This is what she's responding to here. I don't even know that she actually even realizes what it is that she's reacting to. She just sees men from another generation and she thinks something about them really appeals to me. Well, first of all, they're not confused about their, about their sexuality. They're very clear on the fact that they're males and they're confident males. That too matters and makes a difference. Confidence. But secondly, she's reacting to the fact that they dressed respectfully for themselves and for other people. That's just a very 
practical advice for any of you who might be listening. Give that firm handshake. Look somebody in the eye and address them with respect. And I personally, because I'm a Southerner, so I know that some of you would not adhere to this, but I say yes, to this day, I say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I was taught that. And I know society wants to, you know, to, to get rid of that. Um, I don't. When I was a little boy, if you in school, if your teacher called your name and you said, huh? They would say, excuse me? Pardon me, ma'am? What? Pardon me. Sir, show respect for yourself and show your respect for other people, and you will stand apart from a generation that doesn't know how to do that. Very few of them know how to do that. You will set yourself apart, and you'll set yourself apart for success. But this relates to this issue of transgenderism because not everyone has fallen for the bait that they have, they have been so um, confused in their sexuality that they've, they've declared themselves you know, the opposite sex. But it still has had an effect on society insofar as there remains a kind of confusion even among the heterosexual types about their own sexuality. They're not confident in their sexuality. And I must warn you, if you're a confident male in particular, Confident female, um, perhaps too. But if you are a confident male, people are going to call you arrogant. And that's because we live in an age, we live in an era where to be confident, where people expect you to have a permanent uncertainty, as we discussed in a, in a previous episode, about truth, about anything, where you're supposed to couch everything in uncertain terms. And you're supposed to speak in, in a, with a kind of soft voice. Speak with confidence. Speak in a manner <laughs> that makes clear that your yes is yes and that your no is no. And be confident in your sexuality. Be polite, be courteous, be a gentleman, but be confident and conduct yourself with respect. And you know, that's where I think I'm going to land this plane today. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.